Today we're going to talk to you about the Swedish Digital Archaeological Workflow in Action. Uh, so five years ago I was at uh, CAA uh, 2014 in Paris and I presented a paper there about this uh, wonderful new programme that we were going to start in, in Sweden called the Digital Arche Archaeological Workflow. Um, those of you who were at CAA in Paris I'm sure remember my presentation from then almost verbatim and those of you who weren't there I'm sure have familiarised yourselves with it from the printed uh, uh, papers. But in case your memory is not what it was, I'll give you a bit of background into the, the DAP programme. It was a, a five-year programme commissioned by the Swedish government basically to, to streamline the archaeological planning process in Sweden, um, aiming to ensure seamless information transfer between all the different agents that are involved in that, to ensure long-term access to both uh, field work data and reports, um, and to institute a national field work register. Uh, this would involve new ways of working for all agents involved in the planning process in Sweden. And who are those agents? Well, first of all, we have the National Heritage Board itself, uh, and we're responsible for overseeing the archaeological process as a whole, um, but also for managing the National Monuments Register. Then we have uh, people who are probably the most power in the process and the most invested, and that's the 21 local county administrative boards. This is local government, and they're the ones who are responsible for giving planning permission, for carrying out the casework, commissioning the actual field work that happens, and crucially, for the content of the National Monuments Register. We maintain the system, but they're responsible for actually inputting the data. And then finally, we have archaeological field work units, commercial field work units, and there are about 100 of those in Sweden. Uh, and they are commissioned by these local government agencies to carry out archaeological field work, to record, publish, and disseminate their results. Um, and so the programme really was aiming to address a number of problems that had been affecting Swedish archaeology for, for quite a long time, pretty much ever since uh, digital techniques were first, uh, first um, introduced. And that, that is firstly that we have, what we had in 2014, no, um, no national field work register. So if you were interested in finding out if anybody had done any, any archaeology where you were planning, there was no way to find out really. Uh, there was no central digital archive for archaeological data, and the same applied also to fieldwork reports. So even if you did find out that somebody had been uh, performing fieldwork where you were thinking of building your wind farm or your house or wherever, there was, there was no guarantee that you would be able to find out the results of that. And then uh, the existing resources that, that were available at the time were spread out across various different bodies and were not linked together. The process itself at the time was very inefficient. Um, there was a lot of uh, re-digitisation, a lot of um, duplication of effort. The process in 2014 looked something like this. Uh, pretty much any time you see an arrow here with papers at the end of it, that means that digital data has been printed out, posted to the next agent in the line, scanned in, worked on, and then sent, printed out and sent on to the next agent in the chain. So there's a lot of information loss here very inefficient um, and it causes all kinds of problems. Uh, that actually was going to address a lot more problems than the summary that I gave. Um, partly that there was a lack of national guidance, that the process itself was extremely inefficient and caused backlogs because uh, a lot of the processes that were carried out were um, carried out by humans rather than machines. Um, that meant that uh, at the time we started the programme there was an 18 month backlog for registering new monuments in the Monuments Register. Uh, and it also meant that the quality of the data was often either stale or just of poor quality in general. So in 2014, the goals for the DAP programme were primarily to digitise this, this information transfer process, to improve the quality of data, to ensure access to both reports and raw fieldwork data, um, both in terms of archiving but also in terms of licensing, to, to link these data sets together uh, and as a consequence of that have structured vocabularies for all of the archaeological concepts that were relevant, and then have this national fieldwork register, including results where um, you've maybe performed a survey and found nothing. That's also significant, you know, that there isn't anything there. Um, 
and then to sort of uh, standardize the processes across these 21 uh, county counties for us. That was the plan in 2014. An ambitious plan. So now I'm here to tell you what happened next. How did we do? Well, I've colour coded that list. Uh, everything in green is something that we have succeeded and achieved. Everything in yellow is something that we've kind of halfway done or is not quite finished yet. And then the red bits are things that we have not done at all. And I'm going to go through all of those and why and how it works. This is what the new digital process looks like. It's a lot more streamlined. We have a new system called the Cultural Environment Register. Um, when the county administrative board in their casework system uh, register a new case, that data gets automatically transferred to us. Fieldwork units in turn then get told that, okay, you've got uh, some fieldwork to carry out. They upload their results, they upload their geometries, they register new monuments. When they're finished with that, the uh, county administrative board get to sign off on it and check that it's all okay. And then at the very end, the only thing that we're actually involved with anymore in the Heritage Board is assigning which museums get the fines. And then everything gets published as open data, openly licensed. It's not quite that straightforward, <laughs> obviously, but it's, it's a great improvement, and none of this involves any paper, and um, none of the end of it involves us anymore. Fieldwork interventions generate a great deal of different kinds of data. You've got fines, you've got casework data, you've got digital documentation in terms of databases, publications, reports, and monuments data. Um, in 2014, the only register that we had for any of this was for monuments data. We had the science and monuments record, and that's it. But now, pretty much all of this gets stored and pre published. This is what the new system looks like in Fornshirt, which is the, the graphical interface to it. Here we've got different map layers with uh, sites and monuments, other heritage assets, and then fieldwork interventions as well. <coughs> uh, the the fieldwork register is the, the main new part of this. Uh, and this means that you can then register and see what areas have been investigated, what areas have actually been excavated physically, and distinguish between them. Survey excavation. <coughs> Sorry. Um, which monuments were affected by that fieldwork? Uh, and then you get links to reports and the fieldwork data and information about where the fines are. Uh, the fieldwork register also contains all the legacy data. We took the time to go back and import about 10,000 different uh, older fieldwork. Uh, interventions from the mid 90s onwards. Basically, everything was digital before 2018. Uh, we gathered these from the fieldwork units themselves, together with PDF reports and whatever databases they had. Um, it's not fully comprehensive, but the database is populated with pre 2018 data in any case. So again, this is what it looks like. Um, the solid red areas are monuments. The hatched red areas are fieldwork interventions. Green is uh, trenches. <coughs> and uh, you can download these shape files to on the left here. And then if you scroll down, there's also information about where the finds are, how to get the reports links to the reports in our archive, and which, um, which um, monuments were affected. You can also switch to different map backgrounds, so we've got orthographic photos, or you can have LIDAR as a background. <coughs> but then there are things that we didn't quite manage. Uh, primary amongst those is probably the digital archive, which is online. And we do have fieldwork data in it, but read access is currently fairly limited. Um, and the links to reports are not quite working yet. That should be finished by finishing up by summer of this year. Access to the source data uh, that we determined was uh, 
something that was far beyond the scope of the, the project itself. It was, it's a, a huge task to actually uh, standardize what field work data formats we're going to use. So currently, you can submit field work data in, in the most commonly used proprietary formats that are available in Sweden. <coughs> and then we have, and then we have a, <coughs> a new project to uh, to standardise the open formats that we're going to be accepting in the future. The exception to this is, is fine lists, um, where we get structured fine lists with unique identifiers. I'll come back to a bit later. Uh, and then finally, providing structured machine readable data. As I said, you can download shape files and we do have a web mapping service. But aside from that, there isn't very much machine readable data available. There's no public API, although we do have a private API that's uh, field work recording and units can use. And there's no machine readable object data. However, we, uh, we're planning to resolve some of that by providing this data to SOC, uh, which will then republish it as RDF by an open API. SOC is our platform for linked open data. It's been going since about 2008 and has about 7.5 million objects from about 60 different heritage organisations. And that's our linked data solution, effectively. Um, Um, in terms of unmet goals, the, the, the main one really is linked data, which um, we dropped fairly early on, um, mostly for, for internal reasons. Uh, we have uh, a developer, uh, 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 systems architect and our developers are unf largely unfamiliar with linked data, despite the fact that we've been working with it for, for over a decade now. <coughs> um, and kind of one of the problems of being a large, well-resourced organisation is that there's a disconnect between the digital heritage practitioners, practitioners on the one hand and the, 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 the actual developers on the other. And it's kind of a shame that, from our perspective, the, the people who would get the most out of being at CAA from our organisation are the ones who aren't here. Um, having said that, uh, it is going to be resolved largely, as I said, through provision to, to the SOC uh, platform. And this will also close the the finds loop because the museums that provide data to the, the SOC platform, um, they provide obviously finds data, but we're also getting these structured find lists from excavations. And by, by getting them both into the same SOC platform, we're going to, <coughs> we're going to be able to see them. Sorry. I think I think have the same thing as Holly here. Is it not correct? We'll be able to basically to, to link finds records that are coming from excavation reports uh, to the finds that are being provided from the museum, so you'll get the data from both both ends. As a consequence of not doing much with linked data, that also meant that the argument for having structured vocabularies as SCOS was also fairly weak, so that got dropped as well, unfortunately. However, five years later, we are now getting requests from third parties for SCOS vocabularies and RDF data. So if Ariadne would like to write us an email and say, could you please provide SCOS vocabularies and new data, then that would go a long way to providing a strong argument internally. Throughout the process, we've had close contact with um, stakeholders, professional organizations within, ar within archaeology and museums. Um, initially, there was some skepticism towards that program from outside because the National Heritage Board has a kind of undeserved reputation for writing lots of reports and making lots of noise, having high ambitions and then not really following through. Um, but as soon as it became clear that this was a real thing we were really going to do, the, the perception changed, the mood changed. And now that we've released this platform, it's been very positively received. Um, the main negative feedback we've had is from people who were used to using our old system in ways it wasn't really intended to be used. So as a method of showing maps of the country or as a method of showing parish boundaries, lots of genealogists used to use it. And the new system isn't really built for that. The old system wasn't either, but they were used to using it in that way. 
Um, we've also not had very much uptake from fieldwork recording software. The idea is that uh, systems like Intrasys and other fieldwork recording systems should be able to just automatically upload their data to this system. But so far, there hasn't really been much uptake there. We're hoping that uh, that will be something that their users ask for and it will be a, a competitive advantage to provide that functionality. Okay, so in conclusion, the lessons that we've learned from this process. Uh, ongoing requirements gathering is vital. Um, most of the, a lot of the time that we spent during this five year program has been spent in close dialogue with the, the, the target group, the, the users who are actually going to be using the system um, <coughs> through a series of workshops and then iterative feeder testing. And that correlates very well with the areas where we've had success and failure. The areas where We've succeeded in the areas where we've had the, the best dialogue and the areas where we haven't really provided such as the data of uh, those requirements have been dismissed. Uh, we've also had to focus quite narrowly on the, the needs of the planning process and in particular um, the production of data rather than publication of data. So the reason that uh, we don't have maybe the public access to machine readable data is a consequence of that. But it was necessary to focus on that way in order to be able to provide anything of use at the end. And also, we have to recognise that things that in this room seem self-evident, such as linked data, often internally may have been an uphill struggle to justify. So to conclude, um, in terms of digitising the archaeological process, the programme has been a huge success. Everything is a lot better than it used to be. For field work and casework officers, uh, we provide the data that they need by and large. Most of the time, 90% of the time, what they want is reports, uh, geometries for monuments and investigations, and data from the archive if necessary. <coughs> it is a shame that we didn't get the new data there. I'm not bitter about that at all. <laughs> Um, but despite the fact that we haven't necessarily followed through with all the publication options that we would have liked, we do now have a much more solid platform that we can then continue to develop further in the future. That's all from me. Um, I'd like to take questions if you'd like to demo with the new system, then come and see me afterwards. <laughs>